Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. All righty. We'll probably give it a minute or two um, and then we'll dive right in because we do have a packed agenda. Um, but for those of you who are here, um, we're really grateful for your time um, and we're really excited to share with you um, some of the insights from our really amazing speakers. So we'll give it one more minute. So we have given it a minute, although <laughs> I guess we're rounding up to a minute here. Um, but as people come in, um, feel free to um, stay engaged with the discussion um, and definitely think about questions that you want to ask um, our speakers. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to get started. Um, just want to thank you all for attending um, and welcome you to the ninth session of the speaker series, Women Peacemakers Before and After 1325, and the last session of 2022. Um, we know it is a quite busy time of year, um, so we are delighted and honored that you are taking time out of your busy schedules to be with us and to share the space. Um, my name is Himogen Agaretti. I'm the 11th Youth Observer to the UN as part of the United Nations Association of the USA. And in this role, which I started in August, I elevate fellow youth voices in global policy dialogue around international issues. During my one year term, I have traveled throughout the US to discover the issues important to young Americans and participate as a UNA USA delegate at UN conferences to better connect our young people to the work of the United Nations. And I also want to share that moderating this session personally means a lot to me. Um, for the past four years prior to assuming the Youth Observer role, I served as the co-chair of UNA Women and led several of UNA USA's gender equity advocacy efforts around women, peace and security. So this session means so much to me and I'm truly honored um, to be in this space with you all. Um, and it's also just an incredible honor to be in this space in the spirit of recognizing just how closely our youth peace and security is tied to women peace and security and how both agendas can be greatly strengthened through each other. Today, I have the distinct honor of moderating our conversation with our keynote speaker, Asila Wardock, Commissioner of the Independent Permanent Human Rights Commission of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC, and the 2022-23 Robert G. James Scholar Fellow at Harvard Radcliffe Institute. She is speaking with us as part of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies speaker series on women peacemakers before and after 1325. So as a little bit of background, the speaker series was convened as a global learning event on the role of peacemakers 20 plus years after UN the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 was passed, which called for greater inclusion of women in peacemaking processes. Through this series, we seek to understand what impact 1325 has on empowering women as meaningful moderators and mediators of conflict. We do this through deep dive conversations with dynamic women who are pushing boundaries in this field as they share their varied experiences with us. So again, we welcome you to this series and look forward to learning about Asila's experience and expertise in this area. Before we hear from our keynote speaker, we have some short opening remarks from representatives of our incredible sponsors for this event. The School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University, the United Nations Association of the USA, UNA USA, and Inclusive Security. So we'll start with opening remarks from Dean Courtney Smith, Dean of the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University. As a little bit of background before I pass it on to him, his areas of expertise include international organizations, United Nations and peace studies. He has interviewed over 100 UN delegates and staff members for his research on the organization and its members. Some of his publications include his books, 
Politics and Processes at the United Nations, the Global Dance, two book chapters on Kofi Annan's leadership as Secretary General, in addition to countless papers and articles. Dean Smith, I'm passing on the floor to you. Thank you very much um, and uh, welcome everyone. And uh, first off, I want to correct, congratulate you on your new role. That, that's a wonderful, very vital role that you're playing and I congratulate you. And it sounds like you've got a great background to hit the ground running as you've done. So congratulations. Um, I see my job just as very brief to set the stage and thank people as, as deans often should because all of these things are a collective effort. But I just have to say, as I've said in the, the previous sessions of this series, um, I think this series was a great idea to have as a collaborative effort. I remember I was teaching a course on the UN um, when the Security Council passed Resolution 1325. And as much excitement as I felt at that moment, um, as a UN scholar, I felt some degree of concern because anytime something's passed at UN headquarters, you always wonder what's the ultimate effect gonna be in the field. Um, and sometimes, unfortunately, that effect is not much at all. Um, but through the eyes of many, many experts or, or throughout the speaker series and, and through the eyes of Asila today, we are going to have insights into what this what 1325 actually means in a practical sense on the ground. So that means it's a wonderful learning opportunity for all of us, and especially with her background working on the Independent Permanent Human Rights Commission of the OIC, as uh, Hamaja mentioned earlier. Um, so what I really want to do is start that conversation as quickly as possible. So all I want to do is thank a few key people for making today's session happen. In addition, for our, in addition to our guest, Asila, I'd like to thank um, three sets of people. First, our own, the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies here at Seton Hall University. I'd like to recognize um, the director, Zhang Wang, uh, the head of our Middle East and North Africa program, Professor of Practice David Wood, um, our visiting scholar, Raja Atalia, and um, our coordinator, um, Maria, who was on camera a few minutes ago, but I don't, I don't see now. Without their um, shepherding the center, without their putting together um, all of these events, there would not be such an impressive speaker series. So thank you to them. I also want to thank both of our partner organizations. Uh, UNA USA has been a partner of the School of Diplomacy from our very founding. Rachel Pittman, who you'll hear from later, is a good friend of the school. And there's very much, uh, the, in fact, I mentioned earlier that I was t teaching a course on the UN um, uh, when 1325 was passed. And that course, in fact, became a springboard for a program that uh, UNA and the School of Diplomacy has now collaborated on um, 23 times since 2001. So um, we weren't collaborating quite yet on that program when 1325 passed, but we, we started soon after. I also want to thank um, Ambassador Swanee Hunt and, and her work with Inclusive Security. Not only has she a previous speaker in this series, but she has also moderated previous sessions. And with every session, her interventions are always help elevate the nature of our conversation. So um, I think it's very appropriate that I get the chance to thank her while I'm turning the mic over to her because of her key role in this issue and with this series. So Ambassador Hunt. Thank you so much, Dean Smith, and we are so grateful to hear from Ambassador Hunt now. Um, Ambassador Hunt, we're going to give the floor to you, but just want to give um, a brief intro for um, our viewers here on your incredible background. Um, she is the founder of the Women and Public Policy Program at Harvard University. In the mid-1990s, Dr. Hunt represented President Bill Clinton as ambassador to Austria, where she hosted negotiations to stop the genocide in the neighboring Balkan states. Ambassador Hunt has worked in 60 countries with thousands of women leaders. She is the founder of the Institute for Inclusive Security, a major force in the field of women, peace, and security. Ambassador Hunt, the floor is yours. Oh, I believe you are muted. There. Amazing. You're on. Thank you. Well, you know, I think about Roger, what you have done and with your team here and your ideas, your vision, and I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud to, to be part of your team. And this has worked out really well in terms of having the, um, the whole collaboration with Seton Hall. Um, I am 
I look back. Oh, by the way, I have to tell you uh, that the whole idea about the UN and how they really came through and this had you do realize that nothing happened, actually. And I think that for five years until there was Beijing plus five and Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and maybe Elizabeth Wren uh, did a study on behalf of the of the UN to say, what is the progress? And the answer was zero. Right? I mean, let's let's just be really out there about this. And so they required another another resolution. And I think there have been about four resolutions. And so I it's it's harder than we hope and it's for you know if the UN didn't exist we'd have to invent it so please don't hear me I'm not trashing the UN but it's very very difficult to pull off the implementation of a resolution and it happens because people come at it from so many different directions and that is the strength and that is the weakness, okay? Because the weakness is that people have their own agendas and the strength is that once it finally happens, there's this investment from so many different parts. So, Asila. Hi, Ambassador. This is great. This is great that you're doing this. Asila and I have worked together. And she's, she's a hero of mine and she was here well, you know that I hope, you know, and she she was here for a while and we didn't find a way to connect. And then you stayed with it, Asila, and and we finally found just by accident, we found each other. And so uh, you are a person who can speak to this better than anyone. No, I shouldn't say better, but as well as anyone that I know. And I've spent a lot of time, as you know, my first time in Afghanistan was in 1998 in the, the first Taliban reign. And so it's been this this is a area. These are people who are very, very, very important to me. And when I was asked if I could be here this morning, I said, absolutely move heaven and earth. I want to be there with Asila. And I know that you'll be talking about your work and other people will be talking about you. I just want to tell you what an honor it is to be your partner. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, you're on mute, I think. Thank you. <laughs> I am, I'm so grateful for your words. Um, and I think that it really does underscore how incredibly honored we, ha we are to have Asila here um, to speak about her experience. And exactly like you said, Ambassador Hunt, to talk about the implementation, because that's where all these words on paper actually get implemented. And that's when the change can happen. So thank you. Thank you for your remarks. Um, mm -hmm. Before I formally introduce Asila, who is the star of um, our event today, um, I just wanted to uh, take a quick second to acknowledge David Wood, Professor of Practice at the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University, and the MENA Director for the organizer of this event, the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. He has kindly offered not to provide remarks today to save more time for you all to hear from our keynote speaker. Um, so to honor his wish, I am honored to introduce you to our keynote speaker today, Asila Wardock. Asila is an Afghan leading women's rights activist and former diplomat. She was one of the Afghan delegates to the Doha peace talks with the Taliban in 2019. She served as Director General of UN Affairs in the Afghan Foreign Ministry before the government's collapse in August 2021. She's the Commissioner of the Independent Permanent Human Rights Commission of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation and the 2022 to 23 Robert D. G. James Scholar Fellow at Harvard Lat Radcliffe Institute. Ms. Wardock served as Minister Counselor to the Permanent Mission of Afghanistan to the United Nations. She has also worked as Director General of Human Rights and the International Women's Affairs at Afghanistan's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. In addition, she served as a Social 
Development Specialist for the World Bank and has worked with major organizations such as the UN Development Program, the Asian Development Bank, the UN Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, CARE International, and the Canada Fund for Local Initiatives within the Canadian International Development Agency. Asila holds a master's degree in international relations and diplomacy from Fairleigh Dickinson University in New Jersey. While there is a lot of theory about the importance of including women in peacemaking and security, we know that there are many women practicing this in their communities and leading this in their countries. We would like to learn from you, Asila, and how you are fighting to make peace within your world. Without further ado, I welcome you all to hear Asila's remarks. Asila, the floor is yours for you to share with us your keynote speech, your story in your own world, in your own words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor, the chance to speak. Um, you mentioned about that I'm an expert. I'm not an expert and then I don't have any expertise to share, but of course I'm sharing with what I have done and then what I have gone through, um, only my experience. Because if we speak about uh, UN Resolution 1325 and Women Peace Agenda, so I am a drop in the ocean in front of Raja and then Ambassador Swani and other uh, senior colleagues that they are here. But of course, I tried my best to contribute to, the, to that agenda to Afghanistan. Um, if I start about myself, thank you for introducing me that um, I'm Asila Wardak and uh, now uh, with all the, the explanation and then uh, uh, introduction, unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm someone in the US sitting a refugee with no status. With all the dedication, with all the, the work that we, we, especially Afghan women, we did for the country that unfortunately the country has been collapsed uh, last year and we have to start from, from zero now. With all the accomplishment, the achievement that we had, unfortunately now we have to start from the scratch. Um, as you mentioned about, uh, about my experience, uh, this is my second time that I'm leaving the country. Uh, first time I left uh, 1992, uh, when the first time Taliban uh, came, in 1996 when uh, Taliban came in power to Afghanistan, uh, we, me and my family, we immigrated to Pakistan and then I started uh, refugee um, life with so much difficulties because I was a young, a teenager, and then so much difficult life I had uh, in front of me. And, and then, li like me, thousands of other uh, Afghan young and then uh, women were facing. But we never gave up. I started going to uh, English class to do computer classes, to do advocacy for Afghan women and the girls. The first thing that encouraged me that the behavior of uh, a Pakistani soldiers and Pakistani government towards the refugees, the Afghan refugees in the camps, that made me really to become kind of a stone and then to, 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 to start my fighting from that, to, to start my advocacy from that time. I started writing articles to different newspapers, to talking, to interviews, to approach to different, uh, to speak about uh, Afghan women in the camps and then those that they left behind, same situation like now, uh, that we are experiencing uh, um, after the collapse uh, happened in 2021. So that was the motivation that came to my mind and then completely my, my life has been changed. Being the uh, only daughter of my family and then uh, very well raised because I was the, the first daughter and then the, the, the first educated uh, daughter of my family among the whole entire village because I'm from a Pashtun family that mo roughly on that time they were not allowing even their uh, daughters to go to school or to university or to sit with men or women and then talk and then do advocacy. Um, so I was the first uh, woman of my family. That at least, but at least I had my, my uh, support of my father uh, during that time and um, with my, my fight. Uh, so, uh, as I said, that, 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 that uh, we, we established uh, uh, different uh, working groups on women and girls that how can we raise because I was alone and then there were lots of uh, other women uh, leaders on that time also that they, they, they were very enthusiastic like myself to sit together and then to talk about future of the country that how can we involve, how can we provide opportunity, a platform for women to go to school because same, uh, unfortunately, same situation was in 2000, in uh, 1996, Taliban also, they closed everything and then women even were not allowed to go out of uh, their houses. So, 
with the uh, help of other uh, women leaders and then other women activists, uh, we succeed to to have women schools, home schools in, in in Afghanistan. And then on that time, I was working for Canadian High Commission. I had the privilege to. My family was living in Pakistan, but I had the privilege to travel a lot uh, to my to uh, my country and then uh, traveling to different provinces with my father. My father was a great supporter of uh, me, of course, but unfortunately, because of my activism, I lost my father. That was the, 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 the damage that how much my personal life has been damaged because of my my activism. So, of course, these things are not uh, easy for someone that uh, dedicated her entire life for women and girls of Afghanistan and for, for a good uh, cause. So those were the things in, um, but but uh, uh, me and then, as I mentioned, with different uh, category, different uh, group of women, it, it was not a um, it was not a very organized or structured way to to uh, do our advocacy. But then we came to have the um, uh, establishment of Afghan Women Network to have more broad network to in uh, include more women and then to provide more opportunity to women to come under one umbrella. So that was the the beginning of. Um, uh, 1990, um, end of uh, mid-1996 uh, that we established the Afghan Women Network and that was the opportunity that more women uh, came under that uh, umbrella. So make it short, uh, so that, that was the, and then uh, I was luckily also part of uh, a women delegation went to uh, Bonn uh, conference, the Bonn uh, 2001, when uh, um, the international community were talking about Afghanistan and then established a new government for Afghanistan. Me and a couple of other women has the, the, the privilege to be part of that uh, Bonn uh, conference. After 2001, when the new uh, government has been established, I came back to Afghanistan um, uh, with my family. And uh, again, same, of course, because I lost my father on that time, it was not easy, but it was like a small hand that fell down and then again, that, getting that energy to to uh, raise so with all uh, ups and down in my life but i continue my my, my fight um that was the beginning of the someone was asking me that what is the difference between now and then that time that was we were talking only about at least to provide school we, we should provide food opportunity these things to to women of afghanistan but now the difference is that we have so many leaders we have so many that uh, now with PhD, with master's degree, this is the, 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 the difference of Afghan women. Uh, if you compare with two, 2001 and then uh, now, we, we do have a big uh, group of uh, educated uh, women, while on that time it was not that much a big uh, number. And then I joined um, UN Women Office on that time, it was UNIFEM and then with a couple of other uh, women uh, stuff I was working. I, I'm just experiencing from where that this agenda of women, peace and security. Sorry, because there are lots of experience in my life that I'm just picking a small, small example to share because it will take maybe hours and hours if I speak about the whole experience. Early 2005, um, uh, I was traveling to Kandahar to one of uh, uh, provinces. On that time, um, I don't remember it was Canadian or US military that they were uh, working on the um, uh, re uh, rehabilitation of the Kandahar airport uh, uh, with Afghan uh, government. So uh, on the way back to uh, Kabul at the airport, at the military airport, uh, uh, we were just lined up to go to the um, plane. Uh, I was with one of my supervisors, she was a British lady, and then there was all men. I was the only one Afghan woman among all these men that they were traveling to, to Kabul. So then this started searching, body searching, and then it was it came to my turn. Um, a military soldier came to do body search, and then I said, stop, don't come next to me. And then he was like, what are you talking? Because you are traveling and then you're using the military um, plane. You have to be uh, search. I say that, yes, um, I respect that rule, but a woman should come and then search, uh, do the, the, the body search, not a man. So they long, long story. And then they didn't allow me to uh, board to the, the plane. And then everybody said that <clears throat> I'm losing my dignity. And this is not in my culture. If a military soldier is coming and then in front of all men then doing body search, say that we don't have a female uh, soldier. Say, this, this is your problem. This is not my problem. You have to have a female soldier to do body search for other women uh, passengers. So they didn't allow me to board in. 
and then finally my supervisor um, uh, interfered and then she said that okay in front of you if you would like then I can do body search because she was a British post passport holder and a British citizen so the, the military guy they agreed they said that okay you can do so then I raised my hand and then she did and she said that it's okay so then I boarded. Then all the way from from Kandahar to Kabul, I was thinking that so many women are facing this problem, and this is against our culture uh, that uh, and religious. That how a stranger man come and then do body search for uh, for Muslim women. So this was one example. There were other example also by the international uh, military troops that uh, there were lots of night raids uh, in the provinces and then they were going entering the houses at midnight. But women, without women, uh, female uh, police officers or military officers, they were searching, they were opening the, uh, the cupboard and then the luggages of women at the provinces. As I said, that I'm from a very um, a tough uh, family and then like like myself there are thousands of families that they are not even allowed to go out of their houses and then how someone is going at the middle of night so these were the things that we were discussing in our um, uh, weekly uh, meetings that we should uh, raise these issues because it's so then we approached NATO, uh, we approached the um, uh, international communities and also those that they have a presence in Afghanistan that why you don't have gender advisors? At least uh, to, to mainstream these uh, things to your uh, policy. So luckily they, they hired in every province one gender advisor, female, international. Along with them, local employees, women staff, as a translator or as a assistance to work with that gender uh, advisor. And then of course also that was the change that they, they brought also more female uh, soldiers to Afghanistan that they were uh, working. Second, we were thinking that, okay, that was the international part. We should also think about our own uh, country because we, on that time there was no female uh, police officer, female in the, in the army. And then with other women of uh, women uh, groups and then Afghan Women Network and other women at the UN, we convinced to have more police officers. Even individually, I was working with my families at the village and then like myself, there were other female uh, activists that they were working with their own families and at the uh, community to encourage more people to send their daughters and, and girls to uh, police off, uh, to, uh, uh, police job and also to the military and then to the uh, national army. So we got a big number of uh, police officers because it was also difficult uh, on the way security was a threat and then they need more uh, police officers and police uh, uh, women. But those police women, they had so much problem. That, that was another problem that we should tackle through uh, these, these women uh, presence in Afghanistan that we had luckily a good uh, number of women at the UN and the international organization and national at the CSSO to raise these women issues. One was that, for example, the, the police officers in Ministry of Interior, they had no toilet, separate toilet. They were not even using the, the, the male toilet because of the risk, the abuses, the bad words. Second thing, awareness was also another thing that you should ac uh, accept, you should also tolerate, you should respect women police officers. This is part of the society and the reality of the, the country. Third, even those women that they were not uh, able to wear their uniform because they are living far from the, the, their uh, duty stations, so they had to come with a burqa or uh, with big hijab. Even a job was not mandatory on that time, but because of the, the family restrictions, they had to wear all these naqab and hijab and coming to the duty station. And then the duty station, they were going to the office and then changing the uniform. So then we raised these issues that why not transportation to female police officers to those that they are coming to the station, they have they, they should have the, because they were using the public transportation and then they were not able to wear the, the uniform in, in public. So these were the, the things that uh, we were trying on our daily basis. Of course, most of these, these work were, were voluntarily because everybody was talking about having women and then uh, no one paid. No, uh, these positions were not even paid. We were working voluntarily. This is one motivation that still I have that I'm working and then talking and then do, doing advocacy without payment or without any anything because the, the advocacy and then the fight is in my now in my blood. But then, because I had the experience of um, 
working with CSSO, with women's group, with UN organization, with international organization. That was the time that I leave everything behind and then join the government because different experience. And I got a good offer from Minister of Foreign Affairs. So um, uh, they hired me as a head of um, a DG of uh, uh, United, uh, DG of Human Rights uh, Section uh, at the Minister of Foreign uh, Affairs. That was also a big challenge because when I was at the CSSO or with UN organization, that was I was thinking I was work, maybe thinking that maybe everything is very flowery in the government, but it was not flowery because the level of violence that Afghan women that they were facing in the government office it was tremendous, unfortunately, because it started from salary from equal payment, from equal access to everything, from information, from anything. It was a, a big gap in between. So I, I, I joined Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a DG. And uh, that was the time that, uh, again, I was thinking that, OK, so we have everything locally. But now, because Afghanistan is also committed to different resolutions and uh, different uh, 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 what they called the promises uh, at the UN, why we are not thinking to have kind of a, 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 a solid uh, national action plan, a kind of a holistic approach to, to have an organized uh, structure, to put everything, at least to have international communities also involved at, at, uh, at this fight. And then at that time that um, I uh, contacted Ambassador Suwani, uh, she was the head of the inclusive security because having and even thinking of about 1325 or the agenda of women, peace and security, indirectly we were dealing a lot with that. But putting in a structure or in a paper or to, to involve more uh, actors, it was not easy for myself because I had no support other one, unfortunately, from male colleagues also at, the, um, at that time. And then I contacted the office of Ambassador Swani. So um, luckily, uh, she provided all technical support and also UN Women on that time, UNICEF and other UN organization we contacted. So they, they provide all the support and uh, technical support to my unit to do the, to start working on the um, National Action Plan on 1325. But uh, yes, now we need to involve more men at the leadership position. So we started 2010. Make it short. 2010 we started, and then by the end of two, by mid of, mid of 2015 we have our na first national action plan. In five years, with support of Ambassador Suwani and other actors, that we got the first national action plan. The national action plan was talking about prevention, um, protection, of course, uh, participation, and uh, relieving recovery. That was the broad national action plan. Of course, we had so much difficulties in that time also because um, don't uh, uh, blame me for talking always about difficulties because Afghan women suffered a lot. Even on that time, it was not easy to fight. It was not easy uh, to work with all the barriers that we had. There were challenges in front of the national action plan. First, implementation was very much difficult. Despite we had the, the committee, the technical committee, um, at the, and also the executive committee board, um, having all deputy ministers and then ministers uh, from Minister of Interior, from Minister of Defense, from National Security Department and all big uh, uh, senior people, men and that. But still, there was no political will, unfortunately, to implement. And second was the big um, problem uh, in front of the National Action Plan was the, the budget, the resources, because uh, no one was eager to, to provide, I mean, from government uh, side to, to provide uh, uh, more uh, budget uh, to the national uh, action plan to, to implement. Because uh, when you're when you are having or talking about national action plan, of course, prevention, protection, all these things require resources and money and then capacity building and then having all these uh, gender units uh, established and having more um, training programs. So these things, uh, we were facing lots of difficulties in terms of uh, uh, resources. But anyway, at least we, um, we, we had the first report of the National Action Plan. It was uh, March 2020 that the government of Afghanistan, uh, about all the achievements and challenges and uh, the problems that we had, uh, 
uh, we support we reported uh, to the Commission on Status of Women uh, at the CSW in March 2020. And then after that also, because we, we separated in two stage, one was 2015 to 2019, and then the second implementation stage was 2019 to 2022. Uh, but then 2021, the, 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 the government has been um, collapsed and then every everything is, is uh, erased and including women and national action plan and everything but one thing it's very good that at least we do have all these com commitments with international communities sometimes we are sitting among ourselves women are saying that even the national action plan the un resolution 1325 didn't guarantee our rights our achievements but I'm saying no, it is guaranteed because today if I'm talking, if I'm uh, fighting, if I, I have the right to, to talk, these are the guaranteed. If I raise my voice in, in, in front of, if I blame international communities, so these are the rights that has been given by, by the National Action Plan and then these are the commit, commitments that, that uh, we have. Of course, being as a woman, as I said, that I had so much difficulties, but one thing that I always um, advise my, my um, sisters, uh, younger sisters, that you have to start from your mm -hmm. own. Mm -hmm. Don't think always about money that someone should pay you and then you should talk or you should raise your, your voice. I started from my own family, from my own, I have two brothers. Now I'm very, I'm a lucky sister. I lost my father for this activism, but I have two strong brothers that they are supporting of my activism. Last week, we, we organized a, a big rally for the 16 days of activism for um, elimination of violence against women. I was not feeling well and I was in Boston. The, the, the rally was in Washington. I was part of the, um, the organizing committee with other uh, sister with Maria Krami and other um, women leaders. But then on that time, because my mother was ill and I was not feeling well, I couldn't attend. And then I got a message from my younger brother who is based in Virginia and said that, Asila, you are, uh, you are not alone. I'm going and then to stand with uh, your friends and then with my sisters to fight. So this is a big achievement for me. If I don't have country, if I don't have, I'm not a warlord. I, I'm not thinking about having money or anything else, but this is a big achievement. If my brother is going, replacing me in a big rally in Washington and sitting and standing next to other sisters, this is a big thing. So, so this is my advice to, uh, to, uh, to, it's not easy. Someone will not talk about you. You should, you should fight for your, and, and it's not waste of time. It's not late from anywhere that you start your activism, your fight for corruption. We have so much in, in, in our plate. Uh, it's not only about girls education that we have to talk. It's not about women or job employment. There are lots of yesterday. I was talking with one of my friends. He's a big businessman in Afghanistan and he was crying. He said that you guys, you women are only talking about girls education and women employment and the only women agenda. No, because the, the, the entire population is suffering. And then there is no one to talk about us. So we are only relying in, in, on, on an Afghan woman. This is a big change. This is a big achievement for myself, being as a woman activist, that means that they are even relying on us. We cannot forget those women protesters that they are now talking and then fighting with Taliban and sitting and, uh, and, and still in, in Afghanistan. These are the achievements that still we have. And then we are very thankful to our international friends that still they are there for and then raising and then listening to our sorrows and then to our um, recommendations and talks. Thank you. If there is any question, then yes. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Jessica. Um, those words um, and, and the insights that you shared are so incredibly powerful. Um, and one thing that I definitely wanted to un underscore is the importance of keeping these conversations real, the importance of realizing that this type of struggle to work, your activism has not been an easy journey. It came at great personal conflict and difficulty um and required you to to really have to go out of your way um to create the change that you wanted to see for other um afghani women and girls um i know that we have um, a hand up um david wood um professor wood do you want to um go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question all right thank you very much 
And Asila, thank so you very much for that powerful talk. I, I think it really demonstrate the long term work that you've undertaken and the investment that it takes to make these changes. But they're very impressive. They really are. I have so many questions, but I actually just asked one. And if there's a gap later, I'll come in later on. Given that we do have a change in government now um, and you were part of the negotiation team initially within within Doha, what do you feel are ways in which we can negotiate with or influence the, the present Taliban regime and government on issues around um, rights of women and other types of rights? Because it seems to be a very difficult issue to negotiate. It seems to be something that um, for them is, is off the cards in many ways. So what are the ways that we can make progress on this, even with the current government? That would be great to get your thoughts on. With the de facto government? With the de facto government, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yes, uh, me and then um, a couple of other sisters were part of the the High Peace Council. Uh, that was also part of our our struggle. That we struggle a lot, uh, and then work with the government that include more women to the High Peace Council. And then if the the the, the peace going to be start officially the peace process, then we need more women. Because women, we suffered a lot. That was only a small um, experience that I shared about having uh, why we were interested to, to have the national action plan and then uh, uh, women in the security uh, forces and other um, uh, things. But yes, I was also luckily part of that uh, program. But um, unfortunately, from the beginning of that uh, peace process, there were lots of issues. Women were not meaningfully participated. There were lots of behind, hidden agenda. And um, my own experience, because I was feeling that there are lots of hidden agenda, that they are heading from, from me and then from other sisters, that they were part of the, the High Peace uh, Council and then the peace process. In 2019, um, uh, me with uh, other uh, colleagues, we attended uh, the, the first negotiation with Taliban uh, uh, in, in Doha. And then at that time, not only me, other women also, we trusted on Taliban because the way that they were explaining that, yes, we will do this. We are not against female education. We are not against uh, women employment or job employment. We will do this. We will do that. We will do that. And then we were thinking because we are peace, agent of peace. We are only thinking about peace, not war, war and conflict. And then how much war and conflict affected the, the, uh, the, the life of Afghan women? Only women can know. No one can, 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 can feel. Because we do have big number of widows and uh, orphanage, difficult uh, problems in, in Afghanistan. We were thinking that we have to put an end to this ongoing war by any case. But of course, not, not um, uh, uh, a very quick peace, but at least a meaningful peace that have all the, the, the rights of uh, Afghan citizens. So we, we believe that, yes, they were thinking, they, they were uh, saying and that they are, uh, they are very much committed. Uh, yes, we, uh, it, it's good. And then I was also thinking that this is a big change because Taliban at that time that they were lashing, they were uh, beating. I, I was not even able, as I said, to travel from Pakistan, from Peshawar to Kabul to, uh, for the uh, monitoring and implementation of that project on that time during the first regime. Now I'm sitting with Taliban. This is a change. In Doha, I was also personally thinking, though that there were lots of people blamed me that why I went, I said this, that this is a change. See, this is a change because we are now talking in one table and talk, uh, thinking. But unfortunately, as I said, there were lots of hidden uh, agenda uh, behind that women totally excluded. Even those three women that they were part of the original direct negotiation after that, they were also f faced lots of problems that they were, they were uh, uh, isolated. First about Doha agreement, the Doha agreement signed between the government of uh, the US government and Taliban. Totally Afghan government and Afghan citizens, especially women in the young generation and vic in, um, uh, vic uh, the um, uh, uh, people of Afghanistan, they, they isolated and they, they ignored. How you are going to sign a peace deal without uh, um, including of women? So we even, believe me, we were not able to, to, to get all these papers that what they are going to sign. 
So this was another one, one problem that we totally ignored and then um, uh, feel isolated. There was, as I said, there were lots of widows, victims of war. No one was consulted that we are going to sign a peace deal with Taliban. Are you uh, agree? What do you want from Taliban? That you lost your husband, Taliban killed your children. What you are going to ask from Taliban? Nothing, no consultation. Even Afghan government, Afghanistan government were totally. But now, since one year, we are just criticizing. We are criticizing that, yes, criticizing, criticizing, criticizing. But unfortunately, nothing has been changed. Yes, international community are listening to us, but there is no change, one inch. And now you could see that unfortunately in their behavior, Taliban behavior is changing negatively, negatively, negatively. Now there are more fatwas, there are more uh, papers coming to abandon women from going to outside home, from traveling, from different things. At the beginning, at least women could, could travel alone um, for one, uh, one month at least, or two uh, months. But now there are lots of restrictions on, on uh, women. And then a big number of women, they disappeared. No one knows that we are, uh, they are the, the, the protesters. So now, at the same time, we are also working with UN, uh, with UNAMA, with United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan, that they are the one entity that they are very much powerful, at least Taliban are listening. Since last year, a, a number of women activists, that they worked closely with uh, United Nations Assistant Missions and also with um, uh, Security Council members here in New York, to have, to, because they were working on the renewal of the UNAMA mandate, so to have a strong you know, mandate to include and then to ensure more uh, women participation, uh, uh, women part of dialogue and um, to document all these human rights atrocities of Taliban, these things. So finally, we have now a very strong you know, mandate. And then one of the you know, mandate agenda is to create a political dialogue, to create a space between Taliban and then to Afghan women, to talk directly. Last year, luckily, I was part of a delegate, me and then other uh, three uh, sisters, that we were the first delegates that we in, uh, invited by the um, UN Security Council to speak. I spoke very clearly that, please, don't talk about us. Let me talk and then sit with Taliban and the table to talk about them. That you are dealing, you are doing all these things. It's not Islam. It's not the culture. My father was a Muslim. My father was a Pashtun. Unfortunately, Taliban are also mostly they are, they are, um, they are uh, from my tribe. But my father was the good supporter of my activism. Why you are dealing all these things under the culture or under the, 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 is under the name of the Islam? So, as I said, we do have the strong mandate, but unfortunately, again, the implementation is another problem. UNAMA. In the international community, again, I'm emphasizing to, to create these, 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 these things to, to, to uh, create the space, asking Taliban to sit directly with women, with women's leader, with youth, with other, because we are the reality of the country. Taliban cannot ignore the 60% of the population. They are, again, directly with international community, with ambassadors, with youth agencies, and then they totally forget. So what I'm asking, sorry, uh, uh, David, that my question, my answer was too long because I had to connect uh, all these uh, dots, that now we request again that please, if Taliban is not creating international community, and UN should create this pl platform. We spend, it's almost going to be one and a half year. What? The, the, the security situation is the same, the humanitarian crisis is the same, more worse. There is no judicial system, there is no, nothing. The entire country is it's, uh, it's hostages. And, and, but we have to find a solution. The solution is that we have to be engaged. Afghan people should be engaged directly with Taliban to talk with them. And what they are going to do? They don't have problem with international community. They're just trying a lot to keep them happy, to get the leverage, to get the humanitarian assistance, to get the fund, and then finally to, to get the recognition. But they totally forget about the, Af the reality of the country, which is Afghan women, which is the youth, in general, the Afghan population. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Asila. Um, and, and David, for that question, it's a really good one. Um, and Asila, your remarks to it were really nuanced um, and really insightful, so thank you. I know that we are um, we are close on time, so I see two hands up. Um, Raja, I'm going to give you the floor, and then I'm going to pass it over to Kanerva, and then I'm going to ask one last question um, before we close out the session. So Raja, the floor is yours. OK, thank you very uh, much. We still have time. I uh, <laughs> I hope that we are not closing. In, in, uh, we still have like at least 40 minutes. So uh, Asila, I want to thank you very, very much. This is my second time that I'm listening to you in, uh, like in, in a session, one closed and now one open. And um, like you have so much experience. So thank you so much for sharing with us. I want to highlight the three points that you talked about actually and because like I want to open it as like maybe potential uh, work, future work actually. The first one you talked about culture and how important culture could be in order to advance the women based and security agenda. Your uh, example about the airport and the military like in Syria, I've encountered many people who are saying actually the opposite, like the culture would prevent more women inclusion in peace and security. So I really loved that you are putting it in a different uh, way that like culture could be a way actually to advance the women peace and security. And it would be great to work on that. This is like one one point. The other one that you talked about your experience as refugee first in Pakistan and also now like in the US. So how can we link and this is like I cannot stop thinking about Himaja as like a great youth envoy for many women and girls. So how can we actually can we have, for example, youth based and security, women based and security and focus on the refugee issue, like refugee for women. How can we make sure that the women leaders who have been refugee, like in the case of Afghanistan, in Pakistan or other country, US, the same thing for many other country like Syria, for example, the refugee population is more than 25 percent of the Syrian population. So also not to lose on that direct on that an uh, issue of how we can make sure that the women leader and the leaders in general, but women leader in the refugee um, who are refugee, who can like, how can we work with them in advancing the women peace and security agenda? So this is the um, second point. You had many, many important actually um, points, but like the third one, how can we do more on uh, making sure we have the male supporter for the advancing war and peace and security agenda? And mm, I know like in my um, also work on women and peace and security, mm, WBS, male has been a pioneer actually in like really allowing or like providing the, the space or at least like taking of being away in order to have the space for women to be there. But some some of them, like your brother, took like another stance in order like really to take even like make sure that your voice is heard even if you are not there. Uh, or like make sure that you are able to go there like the support that you got from your father, for example. So I think like men for women, how we can make sure that we are and, uh, getting the right support for that agenda as well. So I just wanted to highlight those three, like you had great ideas within uh, in, uh, the talk and I wanted to make sure that we are following up on some of them together. Thank you. Thank you. Of course, um, uh, as you mentioned that uh, uh, about um, having more um, uh, girls and then also women especially in this country and then in all other countries also. It's a great opportunity also for the international community. I'm always when when I raise my my, my voice at the UN and then at the policy level uh, meetings, 
I'm, I'm talking that please watch us and then count us as alliances. Don't see us as refugees because we brought more expertise to these countries. And then, of course, it was not as, um, a single fight. As I said, the international community also provided so much effort to have one woman to, do, to, to learn about advocacy, to do how to fight, to, all these things. So it was joint support. It was joint effort. But now don't leave us alone. But now use us. Use, we do have women expertise in diplomacy. We do have women expertise in education. We do have women expertise in, in, in security uh, uh, sectors. We do have women uh, expertise in elections and all of these uh, different um, uh, sectors. But use us as alliances by involvement of women, because now I can see that more academic people that uh, they are here at least give them more opportunity to, to hire them as a fellows, as assistants, give them scholarship, more fellowship to uh, to enhance more uh, them. Thank you so much, Asila. Um, and Raja, thank you for the reminder that we actually go to 1.30 and not 1. So we do have more time for questions. Continue to raise your hands, put them in the chat. Um, and I see that um, Kinerva has her hand up. Um, so if you want to go next, Kinerva, um, and then um, I'll go ahead um, and call on um, Ambassador Hunt, and then I'll go to um, Pedro Cruz. So, um, Kinerva, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and I'm very happy uh, for our this occasion today that we can listen to, to Asila and, and talk about important issues. Uh, I am Heli Kanerva. I come from Finland. I'm the ambassador for Afghanistan from Finland, but since we do not recognize the Taliban, of course, uh, I work uh, mainly in Doha. And uh, thank you very much for Ambassador Hunt to, to, to mention Elizabeth Rehn, who of course is, is my role model. Uh, and then Asila, thank you very much for pointing out that we, the international community, we also need to, to show our example. So, so we need to include more women in the jobs in, in, in UNAMA and in, in all our engagement with, with uh, uh, the Taliban, we need to include women so that we can show uh, uh, on our uh, own uh, background that, that women need to be there. Uh, my question is uh, about uh, the locals in, in Afghanistan. Recent studies have shown that, that a rather big majority of Afghans in Afghanistan today would like to see girls in school, would like to see role for women. But, but then the authorities are, are, are making all, all these uh, restrictions. Of course, they use the excuse that, that they are uh, making women safe so, so that they, they would, but, but that's, that uh, is, is horrible the way they, the women are restricted uh, from, from uh, uh, society. But how can we now, uh, like Asila, you yourself said that, that, that we are in a situation where we need to start from scratch. So how can we really empower those people who are now inside Afghanistan and want to act uh, for, for more uh, freedoms for, for women and, and, and many other freedoms as, as, as well? And since we have to keep in mind that we should not endanger their security also if, 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 if they manifest uh, themselves. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador. Um, because of the shortage of time, so I didn't uh, go to, to the more details of 1325 and then NAP, the National Action Plan. That I, Now I must say that uh, I didn't see the list of participants that were attending the, the, the program, but I'm so happy, Ambassador, thank you so much for listening uh, uh, my talks, that uh, I should also be very thankful to the Nordic countries, especially the Finland on that time, because uh, um, your uh, um, embassy was one of the, the, the big supporter of uh, myself and then the, the, the entire team. We actually, we had, uh, we take the first uh, uh, trip to uh, Finland. Uh, we took the, the um, te technical uh, committee and then also the executive committee, all these seven deputy ministers to Finland, to Helsinki, 
for one week training, technical expertise uh, training to how to draft the, the national action plan. So I'm very much thankful. Yeah, coming back to your uh, question, there are lots of things that uh, international community ambassador can uh, can uh, do it. One thing I should must admit that I'm against online education or online schools. There are lots of online education, but unfortunately, online education is not going anywhere. It's waste of time and then waste of money. There are lots of people that even including Taliban, they themselves, they provided, they, they established new NGOs under the name of women and then they are getting money and then having all these online schools. It's not, I'm totally personally, based on my experience, I'm against. International community should pressurize because they have leverage. Should pressurize Taliban and then the de facto to open the school, first of all. And second, why I have I have a couple of things about why I'm against because the hunger, the poverty is it's it's up to the peak in, in Afghanistan. Imagine if four uh, daughters of a family, a poor family that they are going to school and then they cannot afford to buy computers or laptop and then to enroll them to online classes. They don't have generator. There is no electricity. These are not practical steps that we we are thinking about. Only one thing leverage that they should pressurize Taliban to open the, 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 the schools. Also home schools, home schools it's okay, but unfortunately we don't want to put more uh, women and uh, girls at the risk. If Taliban they found that there is a home school, then again we are putting these girls at, at risk. Yes, in terms of CSSO, in terms of uh, women NGOs, still a big number of uh, only thousands of women activists and women organization led, they left the country, but the rest of the community, they are in Afghanistan. I'm talking about the 40, 41 millions of population, they are still in Afghanistan with all the expertise that the, the young generation and women they have. One thing that international communities, international organization and UN agencies should hire more women in the leadership positions. If we are talking involvement of more, more, more women at the humanitarian um, uh, assistance project, then if there is no women, local women in the leadership or at the distribution side, then how we are making sure? This is one. We are just second things that <clears throat> providing more fund and opportunity to women leader headed NGOs in Afghanistan, more women civil society organization in Afghanistan to implement training program, all these uh, um, capacity building program for uh, women. Because again, I'm because I, I get nervous when I'm thinking about having online uh, school. I always had this argument that when we are talking about girls education, it's not only about education, it's also that, that the opportunity that we are giving to the um, uh, girls that why we should erase them from the society. Let them to go socially to interact with people, with other friends. It's a good opportunity for a young girl that to go and then sit in a class, talk to their friends, talk to their class fellow. So these are these are my, my, my recommendation and talks from the international uh, communities. And I'm so happy that at least you are a female ambassador that uh, um, I don't know how much, because you're not, you say that because of the recognition, I don't know how much you're involved with the de facto and then you're not traveling, but I would encourage you, uh, Excellency Ambassador, to go and then travel and then to talk directly with Taliban about Afghan women and girls. Thank you. Maybe, Sheila, if you allow you, that maybe having like an interaction between women, Afghan women outside of Afghanistan and the women in Afghanistan with the help of Finland, maybe in Doha would be very, uh, in my opinion, like with Syria, like it was very, very helpful, the interaction between Syrian women inside Syria and outside of Syria. So if you yeah. think it's a good idea, maybe... UN women, UN women actually, they started um, this last week I was in Geneva, and then uh, UN women also, um, uh, they, they had same interaction with um, uh, women from Afghanistan, with from women with Palestine in Syria, and then all. Uh, what I was hearing again from women from Palestine, Lebanon, and Syria that we do have so many resolutions. If they are not going to implement, then who, what we should do? Same now we do have so much uh, commitment, but someone should implement. This is also one of the commitment that the international community put it uh, forth uh, uh, on the UNOMA mandate put it. 
that this kind of engagement with the Afghan women inside, because we personally, we are engaged directly. So from morning, I'm in contact personally, and then like me, other women also, they are in more uh, talking and then talking and uh, contact with Afghan women inside the country. But in official, yes, I totally agree that it's a very good initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for the question. And thank you, Asila, for your remarks um, and Raja as well. Um, I wanted to uh, make a quick pause before I go to the next hand to just um, share some of the things in the chat because I don't want to um, ignore those. They're really great comments. Um, so we had someone say, um, I'm from Yemen and I fully understand the struggle that Afghani women are facing because we are encountering more or less the same constraints and speaking with people who carry the same way of thinking as the Taliban. We will keep fighting until we achieve a life that women deserve. Um, so Hala, thank you so much for sharing that and feel free to unmute um, and elaborate if you'd like. Um, and then we had a comment from Mary um, who says, thanks um, Asila for all your efforts and struggles for your ongoing commitment to promote and protect Afghan women human rights in Afghanistan. Um, so thank you, Mary, for your comment. Um, and then Magdalena had to um, jump to another meeting, which says, thank you so much for sharing your experience um, and found it incredibly insightful. Um, and Edwin says um, that your talk was very powerful. Thank you for sharing your experiences and thank you for your continued advocacy. Um, so just wanted to highlight that and um, give a nod to the fact that you know, we're, we're, we're hearing good responses. So thank you, Asila, for sharing your insights. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to head to the next hand that we have up. Let me see if I can pull up um, that tab really fast. Um, yes, Ambassador Hunt, um, feel free to unmute. Um, we'd love to hear your question. Um, and Asila, we look forward to your remarks. Can you hear me now? No? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, because okay. my camera for some reason is is not working. So you can't see me, right? No. Yes, just the audio at the moment. Okay, let me see if I can fix that. Um, anyway, I would like to go back to Raja, what you said about um there you are <laughs> roger what you were talking about in terms of culture and then also uh picking up a sailor what you were saying and, and others i travel as, as you know and i've not traveled it i've worked in 60 countries and each time when i'm working with a group of women i say you know so what's going on what holds you back now the only thing across those 60 countries is four words well, in our culture, right, it is, it is so ingrained in people that it is a cultural issue. And that is the reason they aren't in the parliament or, you know, and, and they're not, they're not um, well represented or even barely represented. And we have to, we have to take this on. I, I think that um, I think we need to be much, much smarter about how we talk about that. And you, it's a three word answer. It's a four word answer. And it has to be used over and over. It's like uh, Afghan women shape their culture, something like that. And Because if, if you ask um, anyone about their culture and they'll say, well, you know, yeah, blah, blah, in our culture. And then you say, well, what was it like for your grandmother? It's the same culture. Oh, no, my grandmother. Oh, my gosh. You know, and we'll talk about all the differences. And, and I'll say, well, when did the culture change? And they look at me blankly. You no, know, like, what's this question? I said, well, well, I mean, did it change a minute ago? Did it change a year ago? Did it change a decade ago, a generation ago? So the answer is culture is always changing. It changes in nano moments. The question is, who is changing the culture? Not, not is it the same culture? Because we know it's not. And so we need to recognize that that is, it's not just lazy. It is lazy, right? For people who actually are wanting to be helpful, but it's usually a way of covering the fact that we on the outside don't really want to put the effort in to be helpful to people on the inside. So I would urge us as international community to 
call that out every time we hear it. Every time you hear it in the military, I mean, you know, how many times have we heard? Well, well, we can't do this, we can't do that because you know Afghan culture, blah blah blah. I'm not saying there isn't meaningful cultural differences, like you were saying, you know, to get on the on the military plane, you you don't search a woman if you're a man, right? An Afghan woman, but in fact, we have to be really diligent if we want to see change. And that's true anywhere in the world. I want to say one more thing that in, I feel so ashamed as an American that we said, well, in these, um, in these talks to determine the future, we're going to adopt the culture as described by the Taliban. The United States of America said, well, if you say you won't sit at the table with women, well, okay, that's how it is. We'll adopt your culture. We didn't adopt the culture of Afghan women, not the women leaders I know, and I know there's a range, but we, I mean, what a shameful act that was. And, and also in our country, I want to recognize that culture changes were the better and the worse. And we went through four years of a coarsening of culture. We know what that feels like, Asila. And it's horrible. But that doesn't mean that we're starting from zero again. Because you have, you have a group of women and girls. You can't, you can't unteach girls to read, right? So there is a base, and you need all of us on the outside to push and push and push and debunk this idea of, well, in our culture. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Thank you so, you much, so much. much. Um, Asili, did you want to uh, say anything or should I go on to the next question? Uh, next question, yeah, no, it was just, uh, I think there was no qu um, question, only a comment by Excellency Ambassador. Thank you, Ambassador Hunt. And it really is important that we as the U.S. continue to um, do better, especially when it comes to um, taking care um, and, and really doing our best to um, protect um, Afghan women and girls um, who continue to have to face the brunt of these um, peace talks without um, much support. So thank you. Um, I'm going to go to the next person. Um, so let me see. Um, I think Pedro, your hand was next. Um, would you like to unmute yourself? Yes. I Thank you very much for the opportunity. I wanted to ask, although I am aware that there are sanctions imposed on the Taliban leadership, I wanted to ask Asila if it's her opinion that easing those sanctions might be a path to negotiating an improved situation for women. That's my question. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are we getting all questions and then I should answer, uh, Raja, or uh, should I? Feel free to answer and then I'll go ahead um, and ask some of the other questions that we have on retainer. OK, OK. Um, thank you so much, sir. Personally, I'm not in favor of sanction. Because are you going the de facto to, to sanction? Sanction on what? And then I don't want to put more Afghan population in trouble. Because if you are put sanction on Taliban, then you are putting sanction on the population by, by, by stopping fun, by, st by sending money, by fun, by, by all these things. But what I'm saying, what I'm trying to, to, to argue, that put conditions by, for, for sending money or for funding any, any, any part, there should be condition. One, I don't want to politicize the entire humanitarian assistance or funding or sanction. Sanction should be on Taliban for their traveling. 
Women of Afghanistan, they can't travel anywhere. Even they are not allowed to go from uh, outside their door. But Taliban, they can travel. Sanctions should be on Taliban, on the, their travel ban. But not, not on, on the humanitarian order, not on the... Because we are putting the, the 40 million, 41 million people uh, on, on in sanction. And personally, I, I against this. But yes, condition-based uh, funding or uh, humanitarian assistance, it's, it's, uh, I, I absolutely agree. Thank you, Pedro and Asila. We have another hand up. Rachel, do you want to unmute um, and share your question? Yes, uh, thank you, Asila, for your remarks today. I, I really appreciate them. Earlier, you talked about how your brother um, is a big champion of Afghan women, and he was in Washington, D.C., helping to, to advocate. What are some of those uh, additional tactics or activities that you and other leaders do to engage more men to be allies, especially those that are um, in Afghanistan today? Yeah, uh, based on my personal experience, um, I suffered a lot from the beginning. Only I had my father in my favor. But the rest of my families, even my brothers, they were not in, in my favor because there were lots of under pressure, social uh, pressure. My uncles, my cousins, uh, I, my sibling, and then the uh, family, entire family. In 2005, I um, elected myself uh, for, the, I nominated myself for um, uh, parliament and then luckily I failed because I thanked God that I'm not, <laughs> I didn't win. That time I was the first female that put uh, my, my pictures all over the shops, the streets and the hospital in my provinces. My province is almost like 60, 65 kilometers far from the capital. So my, my one of my cousin, he came and said that Asila, you put us, in a, in a situation that I even cannot face men, because sometimes if I go to the shop or hospital on the streets, because my, my village is a little far from the streets, and then everybody's criticizing that your cousin is, look at the picture, while everybody's covering their face in this. And then I had long argument with him that, look, why am I, I, I myself nominated myself to go to the parliament? because of the legislation, because to, to, to put my efforts to the, those uh, policies and then to change all these policies. How many hospitals you have in your uh, village? And then he said that, yeah, we have to send our daughters and then our sisters when they are sick to another province or to Kabul to the capital. So this is the things that why, why you think that it's shame. So I started individually talking and then of, of course with uh, one of the things that I also put it in the, we also put it in the, uh, national action plan under the prevention uh, to and then also aw awareness working with boys and men and then uh, uh, those uh, people influential figures in the mosque and then Islamic scholars that they are the, they, they are they, they are at the community to talk with them to bring the change because if you don't talk at the top level it should be like bottom up not from the top to bring all these policies. So these were these were uh, my experience, and I was always trying myself to be a role model from uh, from Islam point of view, from culture point of view, to not stop other other girls or other women from going to school or from prohibiting their uh, daughters to going to school. That someone will say, "Oh, you are going to uh, outside the uh, home," then you will be also like Asila, then you are not covering your. Uh, these are small things, but it's value. It's a value that I'm covering my 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 uh, cover, my my head. I, I'm sharing another things because um, uh, we were living in Kabul, and then all the time people from village were coming, and I had to because I was a diplomat. I was working in ministry, and then I had to wear a, a suit and official dress. When I was going home in the evening, directly from uh, gate, I was going to my room and then changing because there were lots of people coming and then wearing a big scarf at least to to of course always i wear a scarf but at least to show that i'm like you people not wearing a suit and then talking with you and then different acting different so these are the small things maybe someone should think that it's a small things but it will have a big impact on the life of afghan uh, women and then activists and those, those that they are thinking differently that why we should empower women Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Thank you. much, um, Rachel, for the question um, and Asila for your response. It's so important that we continue to 
educate and make it more um, more normative and, and it's a problematic word, but make it more um, of the standard that men are involved in these conversations um, because it really does take a global effort um, for women, peace and security. Um, and so, yes, thank you. Thank you for your um, comments. I know that we um, have around 11 minutes left um, of our session, um, but Asil, I wanted to end with one last question. And this is um, for background, um, Asil and I had a chance to connect offline before coming to um, this event. Um, and one of the questions that um, I'd really love to ask you is what advice do you have for um, Afghan women and girls? Um, specifically, you know, if you could go back um, to your 25 year old self, I myself am 25, um, and I'm wondering if you could go back in time to the youngest Sila, what would you tell her? What advice would you give to her um, as she kicks off her whole journey of advocacy, of, of activism um, and her role in women, peace and security? Um, thank you. I think my, my advice uh, would be to the young generation, to young uh, women, to not give up. Young, young generation in Afghanistan, in today's Afghanistan, they are more courageous than Asila that 25 years back. They are more courageous. They are more confident. They are not that much, but, but we paved the ground for them. Honorly, me and then like me, other women, we suffered, but we paved the ground for them. We, we create this opportunity that if someone, a young generation is, a young girl is going and then talking and fighting with Taliban on the streets, doing protests. So we are the, the generation that we left these, these legacy uh, to them. And my, my, my last message to them would be the culture of accepting the patience and the tolerance. Despite all the, the, the differences that we have in our ideas and our language and everything, but at the end of the day, we are human beings. And then for one cause, that which is empowerment of women, we have to forget about our differences and then accept each other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asila. Really, really wonderful words of wisdom. Um, and I'm wondering, so um, just looking quickly at um, the people who have their hands raised, um, Ambassador Hunt, I saw your hand really fast for a second, um, but I know you put it down. Um, did you have anything you want to say? No, sorry, that was, it was a mistake. No worries. Thank you. Thank you for um, clarifying. Um, I see. Thing, Maria, maybe you can share also my email and personal information. What uh, if the time not allowed? If they have any answer or anything, maybe then later they can contact me through my email and then um, telephone or uh, WhatsApp number. That would be Feel wonderful. Free. Yes, especially because yeah. we are um, winding down to the end of the session. I do see we have nine minutes left. I wonder if we have time for a very quick question. Um, uh, Fredline, I don't think um, we've heard from you yet, so if you want to unmute, um, and then anyone else who has their hand raised, um, if you could send an email, um, Asila's way. Um, I, I really um, I'm grateful for that offer, Asila. I think that um, if people have the opportunity to send questions after, that would be yeah, great. You can, you can just mention in the chat, I don't have access. Uh, that those that they are online, maybe they can get my telephone number or email address. We will send the recording afterward like to all the people and then we will include your email in the newsletter okay sure. Sure. great thank you so much raja um Fredlin, do you want to um unmute and ask your question very quickly sure thank you uh, thank you for the great moderation Raji, and thank you Asila, for a fantastic talk very very passionate and informative. Um, my question is just a quick one. In light of what Ambassador Hunt said at the beginning around 1325, looking, reflecting 20 years plus later, what, if anything, would you say um, needed to be added, needed to be done differently? What would you, or what additional support would you like to see from 1325 uh, in terms of your work? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, I think, as I said, uh, still we didn't complete the, the second uh, uh, version of the, the second stage of the National Action Plan. There are lots of things that uh, we should also do. One thing I would recommend research, those that they would like to uh, do research. At the end of the day, after all the efforts and then fights that we had, we had thousands of police officers and then women in the army and then uh, judicially uh, uh, sectors. 
in order, uh, um, at the um, uh, police. But what no one is asking under the protection what happened to those police officers today. Unfortunately, even the du during the evacuation, everybody got out and then international community and everybody even uh, forget about having more focus on those people that they were at real risk. Still today we do have police officers in so many um, provinces, they are just wearing and then they are begging on the streets because they don't have any source of meaning, income, nothing else, and then they have to feed their children and their families. No one is asking. So I would also recommend the international community to continue their support with, in terms of continuation of the National Action Plan, doing all research, and at the same time, if they can support, they should continue their also efforts for evacuating those, those uh, people, at least to the neighboring countries to have a, a, a meaningful life or at least by giving them more opportunities inside the country uh, to, to support them. So we, um, we um, I myself, and then I'm sure that those that they were involved in the National Action Plan, we don't want to disconnect uh, ourselves from the, the implementation of National Action Plan. Still that protection, prevention, relief, everything is there. A big number of women that they lost their, their jobs and everything, now they are in Pakistan and Iran, dealing with psychological problems. Still a big number of women we do have in these countries, in Europe, in, in, in the US and everywhere, that still they are suffering from mental, psychologically mental problems, including myself. I'm not counting myself as a, as, a, as a normal person. I really need mentoring still to be continued. I really need social support because it's not someone should, should put they are self in, in, our, in our shoes for one minute, losing your identity, losing your country, losing everything, everything, but we still need support. Thank you so much, Thank Asila. You so much. Thank you. Um, and really just how to recap this session, it, you covered so much um, and gave us so much insight into the realities that a lot of women and girl peace builders face um, and the need for continuing to support um, and the need to realize that speaking on behalf of women is not enough. It's never enough. We have to raise women to those seats. We have to raise women and their voices in these decision-making spaces all the way up from policy to implementation to on the ground work, because every step of the way women and girl are absolutely so important. And Asila, the work that you've done in all of these fields to advance change in your community and the world is really inspiring. So thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Last, last, uh, last word that's uh, because having um, issues in Ukraine and also in Iran, made international community to totally forget about Afghanistan issue and then especially Afghan women and girls. But they have responsibility. They cannot leave us like this. They have to fulfill their commitments towards people of Afghanistan, especially women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. We all have that responsibility. Thank you, Thank you Asila. Thank you so um, much. Now we are honored to share with you all closing remarks from Rachel Pittman, the Executive Director of the United Nations Association of the USA, where she leads a grassroots advocacy movement of more than 20,000 Americans in more than 225 chapters dedicated to supporting the work of the United Nations in their communities on campuses and on Capitol Hill. She guides UNA USA strategic work and key partnerships oversees membership expansion and spearheads important advocacy initiatives to help the United States advance the far-reaching goals of the United Nations. She is a personal inspiration to me and countless other advocates. Rachel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Hamaja, and just thank you, Asila, for this deep and real discussion. I, I want to thank you for all the work that you've done and currently are doing to support Afghan women and other women leaders around the world um, to just support better inclusive decision making mechanisms for peace and security. So thank you uh, very much for this discussion today. And thank you, Hemaja, for moderating as well. Um, you are doing incredible work representing American youth voices at the UN 
and your work on gender equality as UNA Women Affinity Group's former co-chair um, is, is very beneficial. And just lastly, uh, thank you to uh, my co-sponsors, the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies in the School of Diplomacy and International Relations at Seton Hall University and Inclusive Security. I'm just honored that UNA USA um, is in collaboration with you on this important series. And as I've said in previous Women, Peace and Security sessions that we've had, the role of women in prevention and resolution of conflicts, peace negotiations and peace building has not been fully adopted by the global community. And therefore it is vital that we continue to have these conversations and elevate the stories of individuals like Ms. Asila Wardak who are making an impact in local and global communities. Their voices must be heard and must be supported because there's so much work to be done to end the global regression on women's rights. So just thank you to everyone for participating in this event. Uh, stay tuned for receiving the recording um, of today's session, which will be posted on the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies website. And thank you all for keeping the conversation of women, peace and security a priority on your agenda and a priority for many of the stakeholders around the world. We hope to see you at future events. Um, we will be having them in 2023. So stay tuned and I look forward to future discussions and I hope everyone has a wonderful holiday season. Take Thank care. You. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. Thanks, everyone.